Way back in 1630, John Winthrop was sailing over to what today we call Massachusetts to found the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And he preached a famous sermon that has kind of lived in American folklore ever since because of one phrase, actually a phrase from the Bible. Uh, he said that the experiment that they were embarking upon, the big project of settling this new world, and, and the colony in particular that they were about to found would be as a city on a hill. And that is that the eyes of all the other people in the world would be looking at this particular city, this particular place, to find out what would happen. Because he knew, as you and I know, that there are very few times in world history, in the sad chapters of human history, that people have been given freedom, a right to choose their own path, a right to live out their own purpose in life without some dictator or autocrat or something telling them what to do. Here's what John Winthrop said in that famous sermon. He said, For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. So that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work that we've undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword throughout the world. What John Winthrop understood was that the experiment could go either way. And that because they had put their, they, they had given everything up to come and be a part of this, and because they were doing it under the banner of their Christian faith, they were coming here for religious liberty. They were coming here as a way of demonstrating their service and love for God. Uh, he knew that if you know, prosperity and freedom and joy were ahead, that would be like that shining city on a hill. Um, but if those people forsook their commitment to God, um, that that story would always be told of people who tried to make it work, uh, but ultimately couldn't. So what does that mean for us today? And are we still a city on a hill? I would imagine that every American has heard stories that would you know, maybe offer evidence either direction. If you think back to some of the amazing victories in American history, you would say those were moments where America was shining for the whole world to see. And you might look back at different defeats in American history or different compromises that were made, different evils that were done, and say those were dark moments when we didn't live up to our founding creed or to our aspirational goals uh, or certainly to the, the idea of being a city set up on a hill. I was thinking about just the 20th century, since that's, you know, fairly recent, kind of in all of our frame of reference, and thinking about how many threats to that city arose just during that 100-year period, starting in 1900, ending just a few years ago, 20 years ago, the year 2000. Uh, we would say that, that some people call that the American century, because it, we began that century as just one of the world powers, you know, kind of rising, but still young. Uh, by the time we ended that century, certainly in almost every category, America was dominant. Uh, technology and finance and, and freedom and possibility and opportunity and diversity and unity just in so many different ways, despite all of America's faults and anything that we could set up and say, hey, this is a reason to be down and depressed. Well, there's even more reasons to be glad and excited about what has happened here. So we, we think back to that 20th century, and I think about how most of the forces that threatened America's livelihood or way of life, uh, most of the forces that threatened our freedom were outside of our country. Um, and so that, to, to, to confront those forces, the, the Americans of the 20th century had to muster the strongest military. They had to maintain the strongest economy. They had to build the strongest alliances. They had to maintain the strongest resolve to defeat what would look like, at least on paper or by statistics, overwhelming uh, forces of evil. Kind of almost brings that Lord of the, Lord of the Rings metaphor to mind where um, just a few, a handful of freedom fighters end up taking on these monstrosities of, of, of evil. And so you can think of Nazi, Nazism or Imperial Japan and, and go all the way down through the 20th century. And it was as if America was always willing to fight and to win those battles. And I think about my grandparents' generation 
and, and how they fought so hard to win and then maintain peace around the world and prosperity here at home. My heart's filled with grateful, gratefulness for them, um, obviously, and I know that, that we all share that gratefulness. We celebrate that different days of the year, Veterans Day and Memorial Day. We're just so thankful for the price that has been paid for the people who serve, for the people who had to give their lives so that we could have the kind of life that we get to enjoy right now. I think about the threats that those Americans faced. Most of those threats were backward-looking movements. Uh, that is, they were trying to pull the world back to the time of kings and kingdoms. They were trying to pull the world back toward dictatorship, back to a time when average people weren't free, when the elites and the most powerful made all the decisions and, and all the people just had to serve whatever their will might have been. Um, back to a time when it wasn't, there weren't really public servants, it was more public leaders, public dictators, and the people themselves were the servants. And that's why at the American founding, the, the script was flipped. And suddenly the people became the leaders, the people became the masters, the, the people were the king, the law was the king. In fact, in 1644, uh, Samuel Rutherford published Lex Rex, and it was groundbreaking then. It's really not that surprising now, but it, the premise was the law is the king, the king is not the law. Well, we, we would all agree with that. No person is a law unto themselves. All of us are subject to God's law, to nature's law, to the law of our society. And, and no one person can just sort of overwrite all of that and do whatever they want. Okay, so we would think that the world would make consistent forward progress in that direction. And man, 1644, they figured it out, right? The, the king, the divine right of kings and all of that was baloney. The, of, none of that was true. In fact, God gave each one of us rights and responsibilities and the opportunity for our voice and our beliefs and our, our productivity to matter. Um, and, and we find that all the way back from Bible times. We find that at, in a few different experimental times throughout world history. Uh, but, but, you know, shining as a city on a hill was when America became this place where true liberty could actually be attempted and offered. And, and it had to be defended. So throughout the 20th century, you think about the different threats that rose up, trying to pull us back, trying to pull the whole world back into the darkness that it had finally climbed out of. Nazi Germany um, demanded you know, reverence for the Fuhrer. And if you weren't willing to submit, what would happen to you? Well, you would, you would die. You'd be, your, your culture would be conquered, and you would be made to submit. Uh, or Imperial Japan with its emperor, uh, demanding submission or death. See, this is what's so sad. Uh, when, when, when these dictatorial systems take over, ultimately they take over. They, they don't take over the politics of things, they take over people's lives. And if you don't fall in line, then you end up either on the outside of whatever happens or actually uh, in front of a firing squad or something. And so, so many tragedies in world history are a result of these things, right? So you can keep going down the list. Just in the 20th century, Soviet communism and its administrative state and its policy doctrines. And if you weren't willing to toe the party line, if you weren't willing to fall in line, then you would get sent to the gulag. There would be um, re-education for you or, or even death uh, or persecution. Think about corrupt dictators all throughout the third world nations of the 20th century and Latin America and Africa and how many people's lives were ruined by that corruption. Because it, again, those dictators, they're just pulling out the same old, same old, saying, I'm the law, I'm the king, do what I say or face the consequences. Really the opposite of everything that liberty is about. Uh, radical Islamic fundamentalism and, and the terrorism that it's brought to the world um, started, obviously, many, many years ago. It was prevalent in the 20th century. We felt it even more here in the opening years of the 21st century. Again, the narrative is submit or death, submission or death. Um, in all of these systems, actually, it's sometimes it's even worse than just the choice of submit and death. 
um, pretty much all of those evil systems also had an extermination component, where if you were a part of a people group that was disfavored, if there was racism in the hearts of the leaders, it wasn't just that they didn't like you, it was that they would try to exterminate you. There was terrible genocides throughout the 20th century, uh, going all the way back to the beginning. You could look in the nation of Turkey, you can look throughout different places in Africa, um, certainly the Jews um, in Germany and in Eastern Europe as, as Hitler's troops marched through and then sent so many Jews uh, to places like Auschwitz. And in all of those things, you, you, you see their vision, the vision of all of these evil systems has always been a vision of control, um, a world under control, their control. And, and it, was, it was started usually in revolutions of violence, anger, envy, um, you know, d disintegrating cultures, trying to pit people against one another. And, and if you raised your voice, if you stood up and said, this is wrong, this is the wrong direction, they would silence you at best, they would kill you at worst. Uh, you would be sent to the gulag. You would be falsely accused or robbed or ruined. And so many of these stories have been forgotten to history because we're not just talking about a handful of persecuted heroes. We're talking about literally millions of people who died at the hands of dictators throughout the last century. Um, if you, if you didn't get killed, you would be forced to confess, forced to join, uh, forced to utter words that you didn't mean, made to submit, um, threatened with annihilation for your community, your family, um, certainly your own life. Um, I think about more recently, um, if, you don't, if, you, if you didn't follow the, the, the desire of those fundamentalists, you end up beheaded on YouTube. You end up persecuted or imprisoned somehow. Just the list goes on and on, and you, could, you, can, you can hang your head in shame when you read a history book. And you can say, why? <laughs> like, why did this have to happen? And why is it that in so many places around the world, this is still happening? Um, because really, these aren't just 20th century problems. In many measurements, the 20th century was one of the best of human history. Uh, and yet when we look back at the, the big narrative, we just see war and dictatorship and upheaval and overthrow and, and anger and envy and selfishness just run amok across the world. These aren't 20th century problems or 10th century problems or 21st century problems. These are human nature problems. And, and our human nature is bent toward controlling others, even though it gives no thought to controlling itself. And, and it's really no different than if you were to go back further in history, what you would see. Genghis Khan, you know, sweeping across the Asian plain, uh, killing anyone who wouldn't submit, or, or Alexander of the Greeks doing that to India, or Xerxes of Persia doing that to the whole known world at the time. Uh, the Moors trying to invade Europe, the Crusaders invading them back, the, the Aztecs with their human sacrifice, the, the Maoists out in the forest misleading young people, forcing people to battle against their own families, the, the pharaohs enslaving thousands, maybe tens of thousands, perhaps even hundreds of thousands of people uh, to build their temples and their treasure cities, uh, the Babylonians conquering the known world. And you just look at all of this and go, there's never really been any purpose to any of it. It's always been about pride, all of this murder, all of this control. It's always been about envy, and it's always been about power, temporary fleeting human power. Human history, we might say, is sort of a slow motion nightmare. I mean, if you look at it in these terms of, of people rising up to fight against each other, to enslave one another, to control, to dictate, to suppress, to oppress. Ever since Cain stood over the lifeless body of his brother Abel, having committed the first murder in human history, that's been our story, our human story. That's not the whole story, thankfully. We know that. Uh, because there's also a story of liberty. There's also a story of people with courage to do good in the face of all of this overwhelming evil. People who would stand up when everyone else would kneel. That there's, there's stories of life transformation. There's stories of, of hope and joy and family and gospel. There's stories of recovery and repentance. Uh, there's stories of people being generous and sacrificial for the good of others. That there's stories of friendship and fellowship and bonds of peace and alliance and unity. 
And, and, and that's the story that's written when, when people stand up for each other, when people fight for the freedom of their neighbors instead of to control them, when, when people offer grace and forgiveness, when people work their hardest to do their best to add as much value as they can to the world around them and to their own families, when people muster courage to bring light into very dark places. I mentioned that in the 20th century, Americans faced all of these threats from the outside and that that generation had to had to, to pick up and carry this vision of liberty forward into a world that came very close a few times in the 20th century to losing it altogether. Now, in this century, I see some of those threats still out there. But in this generation, I see threats emerging a lot closer to home. Don't you? The many of our fellow citizens seem to be falling fast and hard into the very errors that destroyed many of the world's strongest civilizations in years past. And you can chalk it up to a lack of education or the political agendas of people run amok or maybe disinformation that's flooding into people's hearts and minds, kind of muddying the waters of things. Maybe it's lies told long enough and loud enough. Maybe it's sinister coordination behind the scenes. I kind of suspect that all those things are involved to a certain degree. My question to you is, what are we going to do about all of that? What are you going to do? What am I going to do? We can see the disintegration of our founding values, and that's not a new thing, by the way. When America was founded, those values were, like, they had, that generation had to embrace those values, and every generation since has, has been in a, in a, in a, in a battle uh, to maintain this commitment to liberty, to keep the American experiment going. Uh, we can see, sadly, virtue being replaced by vengeance. We, we can see the darkness of socialism creeping into our political discourse, being normalized and even championed by prominent political figures. Things we wouldn't even imagine 20 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, forces that we thought were the enemy on the outside now um, being so close at hand. Uh, we can see the pitched battle between fact and fantasy, between truth-telling and lying, and, and recognize how complicated it is even to know which is which anymore. And we can see the desperate need for a revival of trust, of vision, of truth-telling among our public servants. So we have some options here. We can be confused. Many of us are. Uh, we can give up hope in the face of all of this. We can be angry at what we're losing or what we think we might lose. We can withdraw from the whole situation, let others handle it, or we can lead. And let me put it to you this bluntly. Where do you want to lead America? See, leadership in the 2020s starts with you. And that would be true of every decade, by the way. We tend to think of the people we elect the people who are on TV, the people who are making speeches, the people we would vote for as our leaders. And in some sense, yes, they lead the way and they make consequential decisions that impact everything about our lives. So we know how important that is. But, but in a citizen democracy, in a republic like what America was founded to be, you and I are in charge. We are the leaders of America. Leadership in the 2020s starts with you. And so I want to ask you, as an American leader, where you want this country to go in the next 10 years. You say, well, Dan, I wish it was up to me, but it's not. Ah, I disagree. I think it's just as much up to you as it is to any other of the 300 million people that live in America right now. So I want to offer you a few principles today uh, to just challenge your thinking and to, to call you to step up to the plate in a, in a moment when obviously... Um, the stakes are high. Um, and I also want to offer you some opportunities for prayer. Um, because in God's word, we read about what it means for our lives to be influential and consequential, not just in the nations of this world, but for eternity in people's lives. And we have opportunities every single day to exercise leadership um, as Americans. And, and I want to call you to do that. Okay, so here's the first principle and this is so important to understand because this is where we get depressed, where we get defeated. Don't wait for a position of leadership before choosing to make a difference. Title-based leadership is the weakest and most temporary form of influence. 
And we see that in the political cycle, don't we? That, that someone can rise up and they can have the title and all the cameras are on them and all the, all the eyes are on them and every, everybody hangs on their every word. And as soon as the next person comes down the conveyor belt, as soon as that person leaves office, now, you know, they're just a has-been and you move right on to the next person. Position-based leadership. If it's just because you've ascended to a position, you've been elected, you've been appointed. Yeah, that's a form of leadership, but that is the weakest form of influence. Um, because ultimately, that, that doesn't have people following you because they want to or because they're inspired to necessarily. Uh, they just follow you because they have to. So don't wait for some sort of position to be handed to you. Most of us will never be handed a position of leadership. Just statistically, uh, most people have to be followers <laughs> for, for any society to work. And so, so most, most people aren't going to rise up and be the president or some sort of key senator or some, you know, big tech business leader. And, and so while we look at those people, we pray for them, we respect them in their positions. Um, at the end of the day, you and I shouldn't be waiting around for our turn at some sort of table out there. Instead, we should seize the moment and recognize we have the opportunity to be influencers today, uh, right now, with what we have. And if you're intentional about it, you will find that you have more opportunity to influence people than you thought possible. Your life might be far more powerful of a life than you realize um, when you decide to make it count. Hey, here's the second principle. Know that every choice you make adds up. That's right. Every choice you make adds up. Think of it this way. America is the sum total of choices that Americans make. <laughs> so that's you. And that's me, isn't it? That, that when we decide what we do with our day tomorrow, that is a choice that influences America. When, when we decide what we'll do with our free time, with our money, with our family, with our morals, with, with, our, with, our, with our habits, with our thought life, all of those things are a part of the, the big cauldron of decision making that ultimately is America. And so while you might say, well, well there's 300 million other people, maybe more than that at this point, uh, my decisions don't count for much, but they do count. And, and if you're intentional about them, and if you're purpose-filled with them, and if you are honoring God with them, your decisions will count for more than you know. So every decision you make adds up. And as an American, you get to make decisions for America. And so we could look at our politicians or our, our leadership elites or whatever and say, I wish they would be you know, more faithful with the money, or I wish they would have better character, I wish they would say things better, or do things better, or, or reference history in the right way. I, I wish all these things would change. Well, that's great, and that might all be important. But those changes can start with you, and they can start in the decisions that you make every day. Uh, so don't sell yourself short here. As an American, you have the power to make choices that add up to make America. Here's the third principle. Don't assume others will do the hard work. They can't do what you can do. See, only you can add the value that God designed you to add to society. Other people will exercise their gifts and use their talents and do whatever it is they do, and more power to them, and we can always encourage that. But you were designed to add specific value to the, to the place that you live, to the people that you live near. That, that is this community. You can look at any, any, uh, any aspect of how people group together, a family, a church, a community, a nation. At every level, you have something to offer that no one else can offer. No one else has the same mix of experiences and giftings and passions and abilities and opportunities that you have. And so if you were to say to God, God, I it, for the, to the best of my ability, with all of my heart, I want to maximize my life. Um, I don't, I'm not just going to wait for other people to do what's right. I'm not going to lay back in my recliner and just watch on TV as society falls apart. Instead, I'm going to stand up and do something to add positive value to the world. Well, that's how the world starts to change. So don't assume that others will do the hard work. Hopefully, you won't have to stand alone. But even if you do, no one else can do what you can do. No one else was created by God as the individual that you are. See, this is part of what America's 
founding commitment is that ev everyone's created equal and has a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We're not, we're not created in some sort of robotic situation where we all just respond to our environment. That's, that's where communism would take us, where we just all serve the state. But here in America, you actually matter. And if you believe that, then you can't waste your life. And you can't waste the time that God gives you. In every situation, you say, Lord, how can I make the most of this? Because I recognize you created me to add special value to the world around me. Okay, and here's the fourth principle. Focus on building into the next generation. Wow, we've talked about this so many times at our church, haven't we? Because this is so critical. Focus on building into the next generation. The reason for that is what you see today is what someone built yesterday. So, so you could look out at the people rioting in the streets, or you could look out at people who seem to be embracing socialism and Marxism and thinking that that's all good, and pe people who don't know their history, or people who are walking away from good character. You can see all that. You can wring your hands about that. But here's the truth. Someone built all of that yesterday, and they're getting their fruit today. What are we building today that we'll get to see fruit tomorrow? So that's why it's so important to focus in on the next generation. And, and here again, you don't have to wait for some sort of system to help you do that. You can decide to invest in the next generation anytime you're willing to do it. Uh, you can decide that life is not just about you anymore and that you're going to very intentionally pour into the lives of others. So here's three questions that I want to ask you as citizen leaders of America. First of all, what do I want America to become in the 2020s? Maybe just make that personal. What do you want to see in this country? Not what do you think will happen or what doom and gloom scenarios do you think are likely or when will all this catch up with? No, I, I know there's a lot to talk about there, but I just want to ask you, what do you want for America? See, you have a leadership stake. You have an ownership stake in this American experiment, this city on a hill. You have a little plot of ground on that city. So where do you want to take it? What do you want to do with it? What do we want to do with it together? You could also ask, what influence do I have? You might already have opportunities for influence. There might be kids who look up to you. There might be other workers or students who you sit next to every day that you could have influence on. You might have money in your checking account that you could use to do good in the world. You might have skill sets that you've underutilized that you haven't fully brought to the table. You might even have opportunities at work to advance in your influence. You might have opportunities in politics to advance an in influence. So you start with, what do I have? What's already in front of me? And then you could pray, Lord, how can I grow that influence to be the brightest light I can to the world around me? And then here's the last question. What will I do now. What will I do now? Watching the news doesn't change anyone's life. It might change your life for the worse, I can imagine that. But you, you staying up on current events doesn't actually move the needle of culture anywhere. It doesn't change anyone's life. It doesn't ultimately fix anyone's problems, and it doesn't lead America one way or the other. It just makes you a spectator, maybe a cheering fan in your living room to whatever team you're rooting for, but in the end, it makes absolutely no difference for you to just be informed. You have to take action. So what will you do? As, as an American citizen leader, what will you do? So here's where we turn to God and we say, Lord, wait a minute. You know, I just woke up today thinking this was a normal day, and, and now I realize I'm in charge of the most powerful country in the world, and all of this is on me. And, you know, obviously, we're in this thing together. You're not alone. But we need God's help for this, don't we? So what I'd like to do is show, show you in the scriptures just three passages that deal with influence and, and apply those to our citizenship here in this world. Of course, and I mean many other Sundays a year, we talk about the priorities of our lives being eternal and not earthly. And that if all of our stock is in America or in this world or in the, you know, the, the job we have, the education we're getting, th that's the wrong place to put confidence. And that's not ultimately a great use of your life just to spend it all on things that are of this earth. We're supposed to be bringing wisdom and productivity and truth to the table here on earth, but it's all supposed to point to eternity. Okay, So we talk about that a lot of weeks of the year here at the church. Uh, but today, we're zooming in on, as a citizen of America, what are we supposed to be doing for America? Okay, so here's our first prayer that we can pray. 
Lord, help me shine brightly to America. Jesus said to his disciples, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on its stand. Let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So, American, you can take this verse and make it really personal and say, you know what? It's not so much that America, the institution, or America, the government, or the America, the country, is supposed to be a city on a hill. I'm supposed to be a city on a hill, and you're supposed to be on that city in that city too. Like we are the people that are supposed to shine brightly. So shine. So this isn't a matter of pointing fingers at people in Washington or or whatever your state capital is, Lansing. That this this is not that. This this is this instead is saying, Lord, I want to be a person who shines brightly. Uh, I want to be the sort of person whose life is so luminous that when people see me, they ultimately think of you. And when people see the, the fruit of my life, the good deeds that I'm doing, the things that I'm involved in, they have no choice but to praise God. And that's, that's, the, that's the direction, that's the hope of all of our lives. And so we pray, Lord, would you help me shine like that to America, especially in moments of darkness, especially in moments of turmoil, especially when there's confusion out there, Say, Lord, no matter how thick the darkness gets, help me to shine. Help me to fulfill my calling as a believer in you to be that light to the world, to be that city on a hill. Here's the second prayer that we can pray. Lord, help me live righteously in America. Because we could take some time and think about all the things that are in our culture that throw us off track. All the opportunities that you and I have sadly, to get tempted and go the wrong direction. And we know that that's out there, and we know that the enemies that we face are not just, you know, international political enemies, and they're not just ideological enemies. There are also enemies of our souls, temptations that would ruin us and that would ruin our country if if enough of us fall for those temptations. And so we we think about the, the addictions, we think about the pornography, we think about the family breakdown, we think about all these different things that, that ultimately are issues of righteousness and they're issues of our hearts. And, and, and so we would say, Lord, in the midst of whatever culture I'm planted in, would you help me to be righteous? Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So we're in America, of course, um, and whatever direction things go, Lord, help us to be righteous. Help us to shine that light, not as hypocrites, but with our, but with our inner life matching what's happening in our outer life. Hey, here's the third prayer that we can pray together. Lord, help me see what can be done for America. Ephesians 5 says, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Understand what the Lord wants you to do. So what does he want you to do? Our our task is immense. We recognize that the, the preservation of liberty... And the, and, and the loving of our neighbors and the, and the serving of our community and the completion of the Great Commission, all of that is a lot of hard work. And, and all of that comes to you and I, not, not alone to try to bear all that burden, but rather to say, Lord, with your power behind me, with your Holy Spirit animating me, by your grace, help me to contribute uh, to this important cause. What can be done for America? Lord, I want to make the most of every opportunity that's put in front of me. So if you're a student, you go to school and you say, Lord, today I'm going to have opportunities. Um, Lord, would you help me to see those and maximize those? If you're in business or you go to work, you're, you're, you're heading into the office or you're going to the job site and you're saying, Lord, today there are opportunities. I want to maximize those. 
Uh, you're, maybe you're in government. Maybe you're in an administration of something. Maybe you're in a leadership position at an institution. Well, you say, Lord, I want to maximize this, these opportunities. I want to take advantage of them all the more because I see the evil around us, all the more because of all the threats that are rising up. Say, Lord, I want my life um, to be used by you. I don't want to act thoughtlessly. I don't want to float with the crowd. I don't want to just be a spectator in the stands. Instead, I want to know, Lord, what you want me to do. At the very end of his sermon, John Winthrop, as he was challenging those settlers for, to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, um, he, he brought something from the book of Deuteronomy and applied it to their situation in their moment. He said this, he said, therefore, after kind of casting this vision for um, you know, being a city on a hill and living for the glory of God and not forsaking one another and not leaving the principles behind. He said, therefore, let us choose life that we and our seed may live by obeying God's voice and cleaving to him, for he is our life and our prosperity. And God has honored that. Um, God will honor that not just for Israel and not just for those American settlers. God will honor that in any of our lives who seek him with all of our hearts. For any generation who would say yes to God, um, there, he, God will stand with them. And so I don't look at this as something, um, something that just lives in history. And I don't even read Deuteronomy and say, oh, that only applied to the nation of Israel. I recognize in context that's who it was written to. But the principles of how God blesses people when they follow him, those stand forever, and those are proven time and time again throughout history. And so here again, we come back to this question, as citizen leaders of America, what will we do? So I want to offer you uh, a challenge today, a challenge very specifically to take responsibility to influence America toward faith, hope, and love. Paul said, faith, hope, and love are the greatest, and the greatest even of those is love. But I believe that these are the three things that are missing from America right now. So you could say America has money, and America has technology, and America has knowledge, and America has military power, and America certainly has plenty of politicians, and plenty of people who wish they were politicians, and uh, America has a whole bunch of things going for it. What we need right now is faith, hope, and love. And I ask you, as a believer in Jesus, who should be in charge of bringing those things into our culture, if not us? So faith, hope, and love, those three qualities, I think not only have they been lost to many in, in recent years, but there, there is a generation of young Americans who have never experienced those three things in their lives. And you know, you could say in any era of history, there's always people who who don't have that or who, who somehow have a really rough life. But uh, I want to tell you that the number of young Americans who are starting out without faith, without hope, and without love is exponentially increasing in this time. And that's where you and I can make an incredible difference in the world if we'll choose to be intentional. So we start with faith and we say we need to call our country to faith in God, to, to the power of Jesus for the, what the, all the things that the gospel represents, to transform, to heal, the power of telling the truth, the blessing that comes with operating a life of wisdom. Then we need to ch challenge people toward hope and demonstrate that hope, hope beyond this world, hope beyond material possessions. Hope, hope of for being virtuous in the future, prosperous in the future, not based on greed or envy or pride, but, but rather honoring God's wisdom and honoring one another. And we can hold out the hope that that kind of society is possible. The love, the greatest of these is love, right? Faith, hope, and love. It's love for our neighbors. It's love for the world around us. It's even love for our enemies experiencing God's love, sharing that kind of love with other people every day. If we do that, we change the world. We do it one person at a time. But I believe that that 
one person at a time difference can get some acceleration. Uh, I believe things can change rapidly in the right direction when people decide to take this seriously. Faith, hope, and love are the three things America needs the most. And you, as a believer in Jesus, you have those in your heart. Even if you would say you need a little of this too, even if you'd say you've been down and depressed, God has given you those things and you can share them with the world. You can share them with the people who live under the same roof you do. You can share them tomorrow with the people that you go to work with or school with. You can share them with your neighborhood. You can share them in your community. And ultimately, whenever you have a platform platform to share, you can share them with America. So what are we going to do? It's kind of the question of all of this. How are we going to lead America into the 2020s? Well, we know that we can vote, and that's how we represent the policy and the principles and the the ethics of all of this. And so make sure that you're as involved as you possibly can be. Don't cede that over to other people. If you don't vote, other people will. So make sure that your voice is heard and that faith, hope, and love are represented in that voice. Make sure you're the one standing up for liberty when so many people in the world seem to be losing that vision. We have to hold strong to that. Your virtues, um, your character, your hard work, your ethics, like as you operate with integrity in your life, that makes a difference in America because those are the little choices that you're making that add up to America's choices Overall, your values, of course, your your beliefs, the way you treat your family, the things that you have closest in your heart, the way that you treat other people, the way that you the way that you conduct yourself in the world, like that all adds up as well. Your vote, your virtues, your values, all of these things are important. Your voice, of course, is important. So many people are afraid to speak. And why? Like this is what America has always been about. And if we don't use our right to speak, I think we will lose it. And so it's important that we lead with love and that our voices are clear uh, for the gospel, for the truth, for reconciliation, for freedom, uh, and for everything that is right. And most of all, America needs your vision. See, every organization knows this, really every church knows this, probably every person knows this in their heart. If if there's not a vision coming from whoever's supposed to be leading, things go downhill pretty quickly. And so if you and I are in charge of leading America, then we have to have a vision of where we want to go. If we don't have a vision, what does Proverbs say about people with no vision? They, They perish. And I really think that's pretty relevant to us. Without a vision, the people perish. If we don't know where we're going, any road will get us there, and ultimately we'll end up uh, aimless and adrift. And that's no way to lead a culture forward, and that's no way for a nation uh, to survive. So it's up to you and I to imagine what America can become in this next decade. Now, what can we become? What's possible? What do you want to see in your country in, tw- in the 2020s? Um, are you willing to work to make that happen? Are you willing to actually become the leader that God is allowing you to be? See, not every human being in history has the same opportunity. You, you might argue that every human being has at least the beginning of the opportunity, like they have the, a will that God has given them, they have the strength that God gives their physical body, they have the choices to make in their life. But here in America, it's as if the, the road toward influence has been paved for us by previous generations, by our own constitution, by the Bill of Rights. There is nothing in your way um, for deciding to be an influencer and making a huge impact in this world. There is nothing in your way. You could get involved in politics if you chose to. You could get involved in education if you choose to. You could get involved in young people's lives or in business or in, in community groups. Like All of this stuff is wide open to you. So will you take advantage of every opportunity that you have? Will you, will you seize this moment? As important as this moment is, will you treat it as important as it is? So your leadership of America begins with your next decision. And what will that be?